So I've made a fair few videos talking about Anglo-Saxon and the concept of being an Anglo-Saxon in America, which is pretty laughable. And it always prompts some pretty hilarious quote. So I'm gonna start the video by reading some of it to you. So um, the Anglo-Saxons are our ancestors and our indigenous populations in England. Why are you such an anti-white, anti-British, anti-indigenous bigot? The title says wasps are racist. This is typical leftist anti-white garbage. Many groups throughout history have been to treating people of another race wrongly. The author should show some journalistic integrity by not stupidly following the Marxist diatribe. You're jealous because you're not Anglo-Saxon. Well, I'm proud to be Anglo-Saxon. Every other race is proud of their origins and they are encouraged to celebrate it. So I will as well. And nobody will ever change my feelings on that. Associating an Anglo-Saxon identity as racist is pathetic. I'm proud of my Norse and Anglo-Saxon and Celtic and Norman and Roman history in my family bloodline. So what makes me laugh about these comments, especially the last one, is the notion that these people can somehow trace their ancestry back like thousands of years. And they're so certain about it. So I'll give you an example from my own history, right? So all my grandparents are Irish immigrants to England. A lot of their names come from pretty ancient, like Irish clan names. Even one of my grandparents grew up in the lands historically owned by their clan, right? And the origins of my surname come from like the 1100s. Even I wouldn't be that confident in saying like, I am descended from the ancient Irish, like I'm pure Irish, 100% Irish, that's all me. I wouldn't be confident in saying that because I know history is complicated. I know down the line somewhere that all my family tree could be from like Italy or Spain or something like that. I simply don't know enough information to confirm like where my ancestors all came from going back to the Anglo-Saxon period. So people claiming that they have Roman, Norman, Anglo-Saxon ancestry that they can trace is just the myth. The only people who can really trace that stuff in like the British Isles is pretty much the aristocracy. And when you're actually American as well, this gets 10 times more laughable. So today what we're going to be doing is debunking the notion that any Americans are actually Anglo-Saxons, a term that doesn't even really make that sense on its own because it covers the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, who all came from different parts of Northern Europe. And we're going to talk about how essentially Anglo-Saxon as a term has been racialized. And if you are someone who describes himself as Anglo-Saxon, particularly in America, you're essentially just buying in to flat out racism. There's no other excuse because it's absolutely ridiculous to think that you can trace your lineage back to the Anglo-Saxons. And even though about a third of the British gene pool is influenced by the Anglo-Saxon migration and invasion, I'm pretty sure a lot of Americans claiming this heritage don't actually know where most of their ancestors even came from when they immigrated to America in the first place. So all of that coming up for you today, but before we go any further, please like the video. And I guess in the comments, simple question, do you know anyone who describes himself as Anglo-Saxon? And how much are you actually taught about the actual Anglo-Saxons in America. I had the question in my PragerU video where they're talking about Alfred the Great, and I was like, did any of you guys learn about this guy in school? Most of you said no, so I'd be surprised if loads of you were taught about this stuff, but let me know down in the comments. Also consider becoming a patron. I wanna build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible, and the benefits of that are getting access to my Nintendo Switch friend code and my private patrons Discord server. For every 5K, we get a new chocolate orange. I've been getting a lot of weird comments about the chocolate oranges lately, people telling me to stop talking about them. You're never going to silence me talking about chocolate oranges, but help me get the next one before I go to Vietnam. An 80K chocolate orange would be a nice leaving present. Also subscribe to my second channel, The Cavernacle Extra, where I archive the live streams I do about twice a week. So a lot of you remember the America First Caucus, which talked about Anglo-Saxon political traditions which we're gonna talk about just in one sec. But I guess before we get into everything, we must understand racism before we start talking about the Anglo-Saxon race. So racism as we understand it today, the Western concept of race really began in Iberia. It was a lot to do with forced conversions of Jews and Muslims to Christianity. But despite in the past when people converted to Christianity, they were generally accepted as Christians. In this context, because the Spanish and the Portuguese viewed them as tainted because of their blood, they weren't really ever accepted. Coupled that together with the Spanish conquest of the New World, the Portuguese and Spanish starting the African slave trade, and you have this hotbed that creates this racist hierarchy, 
and I often show this little pyramid because I think it's helpful. Here is how the Spanish organized um, their plantations in the New World based on race. So of course racist hierarchies are often quite flexible and certain groups change around but broadly that does look similar to the one we kind of understand in that black people are right at the bottom because they were seen as people who rejected Christianity while the natives were seen as people who were quite innocent of Christianity so they could be educated so they weren't treated as badly as the Africans in that they weren't put into like literal slavery but they were still treated really, really awfully. Now we're gonna get into Anglo-Saxon history, but where Anglo-Saxon as a racial identity comes into this is really to do with the Protestant Reformation and the creation of the Church of England by Henry VIII. And because of this, Henry VIII was looking back to the old English church headed by Alfred the Great and was talking more about Anglo-Saxon religious traditions, political traditions, and eventually this started becoming more of a racial identity because just like how the Spanish did not view Muslims and Jews as real Christians once they had converted. The Northern Europeans started to say to the Spanish, well, you were conquered by the Arabs for hundreds of years. A lot of you guys have dark features and dark skin. So how are you really any different from those Muslims and Jewish people you say aren't Christian? So I'm gonna elaborate a bit further on how it became a racial identity in the 18th and 19th century, but that's kind of like the origins of it. So the Anglo-Saxon racial identity sits on top of the racist hierarchy, which is ironic because the Spanish are the ones who created it, but that is kind of like how the racist hierarchy was created and where Anglo-Saxons fit in with this stuff. So essentially, if you're identifying as an Anglo-Saxon, you essentially believe the only real white people are Northern Europeans and you don't believe like Slavs, you don't believe Mediterranean peoples who have white skin, you don't believe lots of different groups who have white skin are actually white. The only real white people are Scandinavians and Northern Europeans. And with that in mind, you guys remember this from about a year ago, Marjorie Taylor Greene launches America First Caucus pushing for Anglo-Saxon political tradition, bringing together a group of far-right lawmakers known for their controversial rhetoric. And in the actual document that was leaked, it said, America is a nation with a border and a culture and strengthened by a common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions. History has shown that societal trust and political unity are threatened when foreign citizens are imported en masse into a country, particularly without institutional support for assimilation and an expansive welfare state to bail them out. Now, of course, this is already dripping with xenophobia. And of course, the Conservatives' favourite, Ben Shapiro, has actually defended them. But I also wanted to share with you, Ben Shapiro actually did defend these guys and he started playing pretty dumb, acting like he didn't really understand how Anglo-Saxon could constitute as something racist. So just listen to Ben Shapiro quick. Also, the seven-page document outlining the vision of the proposed American America First Caucus mentioned the term Anglo-Saxon. They talked about Anglo-Saxon heritage. Okay, and this was treated, of course, as evidence of deep abiding American racism. Because how dare you mention Anglo-Saxon Anglo heritage? Uh, I have a, a piece of awkward news for folks. When it comes to the law and our systems, those are of Anglo-Saxon extraction. They just are. Anglo-American legal systems have been discussed. Well, you can see how all of this has shifted over the course of time for the Democrats, how terms that are not racist are now being treated as racist. If you, if you believe that Anglo-Saxon Anglo heritage is, is, somehow a, is somehow a rip on people who are not of Anglo-Saxon extraction, I'm Jewish, okay? I have no dog in this Anglo-Saxon heritage routine. Right? I'm of Jewish extraction. So I, like Antonin Scalia, am not somebody who feels that that particular ethnic description fits me. So obviously I do find it quite ironic that this guy um, says he's Jewish and he's not really offended by the Anglo-Saxon identity, despite the fact Anglo-Saxon identity has been used to attack Jewish people for hundreds of years. I don't know if Ben Shapiro is just absolutely extremely ignorant or he's just playing dumb. I honestly think in this case, he's probably just pretty ignorant like a lot of Americans are of history that is outside of America. Um, but I just wanted to share another little article I found on Forbes from um, an ultra conservative Christian who also talks about Anglo-Saxon stuff. And the article is called Forget Multiculturalism, Restore the Anglo-Saxon Philosophy of Liberty. 
So the Declaration of Independence meant not to find out new principles or new arguments, but to appeal to common sense. Thomas Jefferson was particularly enamoured with Anglo-Saxon culture, seeing the American Revolution as a historical step to restore liberties lost under Norman rule. He reminded King George America was not conquered by William the Norman, nor its land surrendered to him. Like many American settlers, the Anglo-Saxons developed tribal moors around commonwealths of sovereign individuals claiming inherent inviolable rights. Even the local king was subject to laws and custom. Property was respected and common law superseded civil statutes. Modern rights of juries and public hearings emanated from Saxon councils. The Anglo-Saxons fashioned society on individuals, families, communities and later churches. Problems were resolved locally and only if necessary by the broader nation. Little interference from without was tolerated. People are joined not as spokes on a wheel oriented towards a mythical state, but as webs of interlocking dependencies where neighbours bolstered others by shouldering their share of the load. But many colonists, Jefferson foremost, believed Anglo-Saxon culture striking similar to theirs and reminiscent of ancient Israel. Jefferson even proposed a nation national seal emblazoned with Israel wandering around the promised land and the flip side showing Anglo-Saxon heroes. America's settlement hearkened both. Adams credited the Anglo-Saxons whose political principles and forms of government we have assumed. So what I was trying to show you with um, the America First Caucus and that little Forbes article by that Christian guy and the Thomas Jefferson stuff is how the right wing have historically glorified the Anglo-Saxon past. And just like a lot of far right groups across the world and across history, it's like a revisionist history of the period. Like Anglo-Saxon history is extremely complicated and diverse and even when they did have their kingdoms like Wessex or Mercia or Northumbria they weren't united under a single banner they never actually became united under a single banner because of Dane law when the Vikings invaded and created their own territory in England and J.R.R. Tolkien is someone similar and they like to say that England was great when it was Anglo-Saxon all the political traditions the language the culture that was destroyed by the Norman invasion in 1066, which led to the Norman takeover of England. And it's funny these guys often cry about, you know, how the old England was destroyed by the Normans, not really mentioning that the original English people were settled by the Romans and then the Saxons. But it plays into that whole thing that some people seem to think that Anglo-Saxons are indigenous groups in the UK. So I've read this out before, but there's a chapter of a book that I'm still reading today, and it talks about how the Anglo-Saxons came to Britain in the first place. So I just want to read this to you to give you the context of how these people actually arrived in the UK, and how in fact they are actually Northern European pagans who both conquered and settled Britain. And despite some people claiming this is the case, they were not indigenous peoples to the British Isles. So this is from Susan Wise um, Bowers, uh, The Medieval History of the World. And basically the context is uh, the Romans have left Britain and Irish and Scottish tribes and pirates are raiding England and they're trying to defend their territory. So in the face of all this chaos, the minor kings and tribal chiefs of Britain gathered together in council, in which they elected the northern king, Vortigern, as their war leader. In desperation, Vortigern suggested that the remaining British soldiers bolster their ranks with Saxon allies. The British could allow more Saxon settlements in the south, particularly in Essex and in Kent, on the southeastern coast, in exchange for tribute warriors who would help them to fight against the Picts in Scotland and the Irish. The other chiefs agreed, and so Vortigern sent messages not only to the Saxons on the distant North Sea coast just west of modern Denmark, but also to their allies the Angles, who lived just northeast of the Saxons on the dividing line between modern Germany and Denmark. At first, the strategy seemed to be working. The Angles and Saxons accepted their invitation, and around 445, AD, they sailed across the water to join the British in the fight against the Picts. They fought against the enemy who attacked from the north and the Saxons won the victory. In return, Vortigern granted the Allies settlement rights in Kent. The Saxons and Angles, once established in the green land of Kent, did not stay nicely in the granted land. They had ambitions to spread farther. In a matter of months, new shiploads of their countrymen, along with the Jutes, allies of the Angles who lived on the Danish peninsula just north of them, were arriving on the southeastern shores in longships. Led by two Saxon brothers named Hengis and Horsa, 
Uh, just a clarification, um, historians now basically feel these two people didn't actually exist. They were said to have descended from a Wooten, which is the German's version of Odin. But these days they're speculating these are either mythical figures or an amalgamation of different warlords. Uh, the Jutes occupied the southern coast. The Saxons moved from Kent further inland to the south and southwest of Londinium. And the Angles invaded the southeastern coast just above the Thames. Destruction reigned. The British tribes allied behind Vortigern spent six years fighting fruitlessly against this overwhelming influx. The invaders seemed unstoppable. In 455, Vortigern finally managed to defeat the invaders in a pitched battle at the fords of the Medway River in Kent. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that Horsa was killed. The loss of one of their chiefs forced the invaders to regroup, and for a few brief moments, Vortigern must have hoped a victory. But Horsa's son took up his father's mantle, and the balance tipped back. For the next 15 years, war continued, each year seeing a new and violent conflict between Vortigern, his men, and the newcomers, neither side gaining the advantage. So the battles between Vortigern and the Saxons and the Angles and the Jutes is actually the inspiration um, for King Arthur, and there's a lot of stories that put Vortigern in the King Arthur stories along with all the other characters. I think King Arthur's meant to be like the grandson of one of the last Roman generals in Britain or something like that. But uh, that was just to show you that these groups, the Anglo-Saxons who actually constituted more than just the Angles and Saxons because the Jutes were there as well, were pagan invaders who came to Britain to settle, to conquer, and eventually changed the face of modern Britain because they became the dominant elite in the country, conquering most of what we know as modern England, but setting up various kingdoms that often went to war against each other. And unlike some of the Romanized Celts and Roman citizens still left in England, these guys were all pagans and didn't become Christian until about, I think it's like 150 years later, with a monk called Gregory coming over and being given, I think, Canterbury, by a Saxon king to set up as the first British monastery. Of course, it's a very important part of UK Christianity today. But I think that's just important to understand when people start talking about the Anglo-Saxons like they are indigenous to Britain, when they're not. And when people are crying about how the Normans destroyed English culture by pushing out the Anglo-Saxon elite, that real English culture was destroyed far longer ago, which is something that people like Tolkien don't really seem to care about. So now I want to change it up and talk about the modern racialization of Anglo-Saxon and how it became a racial identity. So at the start of the video, we talked about Henry VIII, we talked about the construction of modern racism, but now we have to fast forward to, I guess, the age of European colonialism, but also America as well, where Anglo-Saxon became far more important as, I guess, a lasting racial identity, where in the UK, pretty much, if you say Anglo-Saxon to someone, they're just going to think you're talking about history or, you know, Vikings or the Last Kingdom. But in the US, it became far more normalised thanks to people like Thomas Jefferson. So I read this passage in one of my um, other videos on this stuff. I just wanted to read it again before going into some new material I found. So, um, although I believe in Anglo-Saxon racial superiority was a vital ingredient in English and American thought of the 19th century, the study of this belief has been largely neglected by historians. The best work is that of L.P. Curtis, who in studying anti-Irish prejudice in the second half of the 19th century, has analysed far broader aspects of Anglo-Saxonism. Curtis points out that this Anglo-Saxonism of the middle and late 19th century was far different from the earlier 16th and 17th century adulation of the Anglo-Saxon period as a golden age of free institutions. A belief in Anglo-Saxon freedom once used to defend popular liberties had by the middle of the 19th century been transformed into a rationale for the domination of people throughout the world. The heyday of Anglo-Saxonism came in the late 19th century, but the essential transformation had occurred earlier. Although Curtis has effectively analysed aspects of Anglo-Saxonism in the last half of the 19th century, little detailed attention has been devoted to the process by which an earlier stress on the Anglo-Saxon liberties was, by 1850, transformed into a racist doctrine. So before we finish with like the modern genetic makeup um, of England, I found a really good article by Matthew Dentis, and it was in response to the America First caucus, and it's a very, very extensive uh, history of the use of Anglo-Saxon as a racial identity in the US. And I thought I'd share some of it with you today because I do think it's very, very helpful and elaborates on a lot of the stuff I've been covering 
uh, so far. So Saxonism and American racial identity. Nowhere was this truer than in Britain's American colonies where white settlers took to the new identification with the Anglo-Saxons with gusto. Indeed, it was the American colonists who in large part drove the early development of Saxonism, reflecting on the usage of Anglo-Saxon to describe modern Anglophone people. Young notes, this usage seems to have been invented around the time of the American Revolution for the formerly English colonists who adopted the name of the English ancestors with whom they most identified, with that usage subsequently being imported back to Britain itself. Not only was Saxonism well rooted in American soil by the time of independence, but it was also a central pillar of the revolution's ideological framework. As Reginald Horsman explains in Race and Manifest Destiny, as colonial Englishmen, the settlers in America fully absorbed the mythical view of the English past developed between 1530 with Henry VIII and 1730, a mythos which privileged the Anglo-Saxons as an especially freedom-loving people whose innate Republican impulses had been smothered beneath the yoke of Norman tyranny. The dichotomy was especially important, according to Horsman, the colonists believed fully that the Anglo-Saxons were a partially successful branch of a freedom-loving Germanic people described by Tacitus, and thus their settlement of Britain had allowed for liberty and the institutions of representative government to flourish on new shores. The Normans, by contrast, were brutal and autocratic, introducing everything which the colonists found wrong with Britain's unwritten constitution. This made it particularly easy for the colonists to justify their break with Britain. Rather than being a riot of rebellious subjects against their homeland, the revolutionaries cast the War of Independence as a struggle by true Anglo-Saxons, once more bringing representative government to new shores, to cast off the supposed foreign innovations of the Normans and restore a pristine form of English liberty. Also according to Horsman, in Jefferson's stress on the attributes of the particular peoples involved in creating Saxon so-called free institutions, he was foreshadowing the later interest in the racial origin of Anglo-Saxon accomplishments. The Anglo-Saxons of popular history had not come to dwell in an unoccupied land. Rather, they found a land already occupied, threw out its original inhabitants, and took it for themselves. The colonists themselves also came to a land already occupied by Native Americans and to the south by the inhabitants of Spain's soon-to-be former colonies. They would apply the same methods of procuring it as they told themselves their ancestors did. What was more, they would do so while also practicing the most brutal form of slavery the world has ever known, all in the name of expanding the Anglo-Saxon race to the four corners of the globe. The logic of an all-conquering superior Anglo-Saxon race was also applied in the American South as a way of justifying the, and expanding slavery. White Southerners had a particular fascination with the image of an idolised Anglo-Saxon England. Walter Scott's medievalist novels were adopted as a cultural template for the plantation aristocracy obsessed with proving their descent from Anglo-Norman noble stock. The common element was a view of the Anglo-Saxons as a singular people, consistent in their racial makeup and characteristics throughout time, whose movement through history was marked by the conquest of new lands and the extermination or subjugation of other people. Such a way of life was justified because the Saxons and the Saxons alone possessed a proper understanding of liberty and a true aptitude for self-rule. While the Saxon admirers had long considered these to be particular Anglo-Saxon virtues, it was white Americans who showed the most determination to transform them into unique racial traits. As John O'Sullivan remarked in 1837, many an English and American politician in the pride of his soul takes it for an axiom that the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-American races are the only ones capable of freedom and that every other is necessarily doomed to slavery. This was a common perception across all of which was justified because the Saxons were bringing their unique racial values of liberty and self-rule to every corner of the world. It does seem quite funny the fascination with Anglo-Saxons and that people deserve to be conquered by them because only they alone understood republicanism and democracy and freedom when that wasn't quite true. When you read about Anglo-Saxons compared to like other tribes during the time, they all have their nuances. There are interesting differences between them. If you look at how the Franks often elected leaders, how they set up this like mayoral system to divide like the Holy Roman Empire. There's also some republics going on in medieval times as well. And of course you do have the legacy of Greek um, democracy and the Roman political system. I find it funny that they think the Normans destroyed 
all of this supposed democracy and republicanism, despite also saying that like the Magna Carta is like a founding document um, for democracy and freedom, which was signed by people who followed on from the Norman conquest. But this glorified view of the Anglo-Saxons and like the various councils they held as the precursor to the American Republic is pretty laughable. Just like the Germans in the 1930s, it just seems that because of a lot of the founding fathers having English ancestry, they wanted to glorify something that was part of this ancestry. And because a lot of Americans could trace their lineage back to Northern Europe as well, they liked to tie it all into one. And the real English who loved freedom and democracy were actually German immigrant and Danish immigrants who came in the 400s as pagan conquerors. And the push for more democracy in Britain, which would follow the Norman Conquest, not because of the Norman Conquest, wasn't actually the true virtues of England. Old England is Alfred the Great, Wessex, and all this different stuff. But something I hadn't really thought about until I made this video was the conquest angle. And now, of course, it makes a lot of sense. But I didn't really think about it in that way, in that another part of attaching themselves to this old culture, this old medieval lifestyle was that the Saxons were also conquerors and they also uprooted native peoples or Romanized native peoples in favor of creating their own system of government. But it's just another level to how Anglo-Saxon identity in the US is deeply racist. Not only are they placing themselves above all the other racists in their racist hierarchies, they're also loving the Anglo-Saxons for being this conquering force to spread republicanism and democracy and people who fall to their like military might deserve it. And of course you also had there that the Confederacy also used Anglo-Saxonism to justify their slavery of people. I do find it funny in my research that none of the founding fathers talk about the Anglo-Saxons like getting their asses handed to them by the Vikings and how the Vikings under Dane law owned like half of England. I guess it doesn't really fit into the narrative about the superiority of Anglo-Saxonism. So as you're getting the vibe from in this video, it seems really weird to attach this whole racial identity onto a group of people who aren't even like one ethnic group of people. They are closely related, but they are different. The Jutes, the Angles, and the Saxons. And of course, when they came to Britain in very large numbers, they mixed with the local population who were largely Romanized Celts or actual people from the Roman Empire. So it seems quite laughable that many Americans so removed from this time period would claim this racial identity as like it makes sense. Like, yes, you are descended from the Anglo-Saxons. You know that with absolute certainty. Like, you must be, and you should be proud of your Anglo-Saxon heritage, despite the fact there's no way in hell you would know if you were descended from the Anglo-Saxons. The same way as someone who actually can trace their history quite far back to like the 1100s. I don't know if that is my actual history because somewhere down the line, my ancestors could have migrated to Ireland from another part of the world and joined the clan where my family are from. It's probably more likely I have those ancestors than people who claim to have Anglo-Saxon ancestors. But again, I'm very happy to admit, I don't know that at all. So for Americans in 2022, to claim descent from Anglo-Saxons who lost control of England to the Normans in 1066 is quite laughable. While a lot of Americans do have descendants going back to England, there's been so much population mixing in America that it would be pretty ridiculous to claim that you could trace your ancestry back to Anglo-Saxon times even if you do have English ancestors. So it becomes even more ridiculous as a racial identity. And those comments I read you out at the start seem even more silly because on multiple levels this racial identity just does not make any sense like maybe if you were someone in east anglia that could prove to me that yes you are descended from anglo-saxons i'd maybe accept that a bit more even though i do find it ridiculous but if you are an american who cannot even trace their history just vaguely know that your ancestors were maybe english and maybe not even all of them were english maybe some were like germans or some were from other parts of Europe and you're telling me you're proud of your Anglo-Saxon heritage, then I just know you're a racist because the only people who claim that in America have bought into the racialization and the racial identity of Anglo-Saxon, which makes no sense, was just picked up upon by the racist founding fathers to justify their colonization of native peoples, their enslavement of African peoples, and breaking away from the English state who they viewed as tainted by the Normans. 
Anyway, that is it for the video. I know I've made a couple videos on Anglo-Saxonism. I thought I'd make this one to just conclude it, round it all up. So if you want, you can send it to someone who claims to be an Anglo-Saxon and they can watch it and realize how much of an idiot they are or a racist or both. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Subscribe if you're new. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.